Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to read chapter 6 and who was Thomas Alva Edison? Let's take a look. This chapter is titled Making Moving Pictures. In 1884, at the height of his success, Tom suffered a terrible loss. His wife Mary died of an illness. She was only 29 years old. Tom had his children stay in New York City. His electricity business was there. He wanted to spend as much time as possible with Marion, now twelve, Thomas, now eight, and little William, who was only five. Then, in 1885, Tom met a young woman named Mina Miller. Her family was from Ohio. Mina's father was a millionaire businessman, an inventor who had developed a very successful machine for harvesting grain. He himself received 92 patents in his lifetime. Tom fell in love with Mina almost at once. She was interesting and educated. He even taught her Morse code so that they could talk to each other, secretly, even among friends. It is said that Tom tapped out, Will you marry me, on the, the palm of her hand, and Mina tapped back, Yes. Mina and Tom were married in 1886 and moved to a grand home, Glenmont, in West Orange, New Jersey. It is a great deal too nice for me, but it isn't half nice enough for my little wife here, Tom said. Tom and Mina were happy together. He was still at work as much as he had been when Mary was alive, but since Mina's father was also an inventor, perhaps she understood Tom's world better. Still, it wasn't so easy for 20-year-old Mina to become the young mother of three children. Nor was it easy for Marion, who was now 14 and had become a companion to her father. Years later, she said Mina was too young to be a mother to me, but too old to be a chum. Mina and Tom and three children. Mad Mina and Tom had three children. Madeline, Charles, and Theodore. There's a family picture. Holiday, holiday. Holidays above all were a time when Tom loved being at home with his large family. Mina planned lavish parties for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter, but the 4th of July was all Tom's. Everybody had to go outside very early, even before breakfast. What? For the fireworks that Tom had made himself. After breakfast and, and naps for the younger children, they rushed out for more activities, like picnics of watermelon, picnics of watermelon and ice cream, and and so it went on into the evening, ending with another enormous display of fireworks. Unlike Mary, Mina loved having company. She gave large dinner parties, where. Tom often tried to avoid by pretending to be sick. Their guest book was filled with the names of famous people. Airplane pioneer Orville Wright, author and lecturer Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf from the age of two, and automobile maker Henry Ford. He wrote at the end of his stay, two of the best days I have ever spent. Moving to Glenmont made Tom decide to leave his Menlo Park laboratory. He built a new laboratory complex, a mile from his home in West Orange. He wanted it to be the best in the world. I will have the best equipped and largest facility for rapid and cheap development of an invention, Tom declared. Tom had never forgotten his wish to give people what they wanted. Because of his great success with the electric light, he had the money, the power, and the influence to do it. The West Orange Complex opened in November 1887. It had a laboratory building three stories high. There was a physics lab, a chemistry lab, and a private lab just for Tom, where he could focus and think about without being interrupted. That would be pretty cool. But for Tom, the center of West Orange was a large library. <laughs> Excuse me. With two galleries, a 40-foot ceiling, walls walls full of photographs and plaques, and shelves filled with 10, 
thousand books and magazines. That sounds cool. I like that. Um, but they were from all around the world. Here Tom had his desk and a conference table, and it was here that Tom met the public, friends, investors, inventors, reporters, and editors. West Orange was ten times larger than Menlo Park, and at one time... <sighs> Sorry, it's late. <laughs> and at one time had as many as 10,000 workers. At any one time, as many as 30 companies worked on projects run by teams directed by Tom. Along with new ideas, Tom never lost interest in improving his baby, the phonograph. He might wander away from it and work on other inventions, but he always came back to it. Not everything was a success. One of the things the boys talked Tom into making was a talking doll for a Boston company. A small cylinder was put inside the two-foot-tall doll. A handle to turn the cylinder came out of the her back. The talking doll worked fine in the factory, reciting poems and popular nursery rhymes. But when she reached the stores, nothing. All the thumping and bumping along the way had disturbed the mechanism. Most of the dolls never said a word. Bummer. So he, they had a good idea, because talking dolls are pretty popular at one point. But didn't quite work out. In August 1889, Mina and Tom sailed to Paris for the Universal ex Exhibition. This, this was like a big fair for showing new products from many countries. There was a huge Edison display. His phonograph was the most popular attraction. Only the new Eiffel Tower, the highest structure in the world at the time, had more visitors. Ooh, here's a good picture of the Eiffel Tower. So the Eiffel Tower was actually made at that point. Let's read a little bit about it. La Tower Eiffel stands 984 feet high over the city of Paris. It took 300 men two years to build it. It is made of 15,000 pieces of iron held together by 2.5 million rivets. It can sway almost five inches in strong winds. Ooh, that's scary. Uh, 40 tons of paints are needed to cover the tower, which remain the tallest structure in the world. <sighs> until 1930 when the Chrysler building soon followed by the Empire State Building was was erected in New York City so um, it was the tallest building in the world for a while and then uh, New York built a few other buildings that are a little bit taller the Eiffel Tower was completed in 1889 for the 100-year anniversary of the French Revolution. Gustave Eiffel's design won the competition from among the 700 entries sent in. Some years earlier, he had designed the iron skeleton for the inside of the Statue of Liberty, and he supervised the raising of the famous lady in New York Harbor in 1886. Take a look at some other things. Right there. Photographic gun. During this trip, Tom visited a Frenchman whose photographic gun had captured animals in mo motion, such as birds in flight. Tom was interested in, in moving pictures. In October 1888, he had written, I am experimenting upon an instrument which does for the eye what the photo phonograph does for the ear. This apparatus I called the kinetoscope, or moving view. Tom was a pioneer in developing a system for filming and showing movie moving pictures. His kinetoscope was the camera, 
which took the pictures. His kinetic scope provided a way for, at, of looking at them. In 1893, the first motion pic picture studio in America was built at West Orange. He named it the Black Mariah. So, uh, movies were a little different back then. It wasn't the same because they had to figure out how to take the pictures like that. So, he met this person who was able to take a picture of something moving. That sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? Because I know when you guys are getting your pictures taken, you're almost always moving, aren't you? Way, way back when, when the first photographs were taken, people had to sit very, very still. If they moved at all during the picture, the picture would be really blurry, and you wouldn't be able to make out what, who it was. So taking a picture of something that's moving was really, really cool. And then making a movie with it... Well, that was something all on its own. That's pretty awesome. Okay. We're going to look a little bit about a photographer right there. The first successful photo photographic process was the, ooh, big word, daguerreotype, named after Frenchman Louis J.M. Daguerreau in 1837. It produced a detailed black and white picture and was described as a mirror with a memory. The next important breakthrough came in 1851 when a British photographer, Frederick Scott Archer, that's cool, discovered a way to make as many prints as he wanted to um, off an image. Then in 1888, American George Eastman introduced the Kodak box camera. It was easy to carry around, so photo photographers didn't have to stay in an indoor studio with dark room nearby. It was cheap and easy to operate, and the roll of celluloid or plastic film could take 100 black and white photographs. This film made it possible for Edison to make a moving picture. Very cool. And you know what? I actually have a box camera that's very similar to that. I'll have to show you guys it sometime. About 50 feet long, the Black Mariah was a weird-looking structure. It had a slanted roof that opened up and with a pulley to let in the sun. It sat on a round platform with the tracks like railroad tracks and moved around in a circle following the path of the sun. Filming in the Black Mariah started in 1893. An early film showed a man sneezing, performed happily by a mechanic who worked at the West Orange. Let's take a look at the building. That is kind of funny. So they can lift the roof up a little bit. Hmm. The first boxing match ever filmed starred heavyweight champion Gentleman Jim Corbett. Um, Edison also filmed dance groups, acrobats, clowns, jugglers, and even the world's strongest man. When Buffalo Bill's Wild West show came, see Buffalo Bill. Came to town. Sharpshooter Annie Oakley was filmed there, too. Most were short pieces that last about 20 or 30 seconds. One of the first stories filmed at the West Orange was about a fireman. They are woken up by a fire alarm and rush off from the firehouse to a fire. They save a baby and put out the fire. There wasn't any sound. Still, people were excited to look at it. Tom's main interest in movies was in making better equipment like his kinetoscope and his kinetograph. But as, but as time went on, he drifted away to work on other ideas. He was not as closely involved as he had been with the phonograph and the light bulb. He offered, su offered suggestions to his team, but he let them do a lot of the ideas and improvements without him. Eventually, he decided to go to get out of the movie business. There's Annie Oakley. There's a picture of a movie. So they couldn't hear anything, 
but it was still something new that they had never seen before. So that's pretty cool, and it's it's fun to think back to how things have changed. Uh, way back when, there were no movies, and even then, when movies finally did come out, they were not like how they are today. So it'd be fun to talk with um, maybe someone at home, like a mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, and see how have movies changed since they were little. That'd be a pretty fun conversation, I think. Well, you guys have a wonderful day. We will read Chapter 7 tomorrow. Okay? See you guys later. Bye, everyone.